might be done. God, believe, we believe that it will be done in your name because you have all power. Nothing can stop you. Nothing can hold back your goodness in our lives, God. We declare it today. Hallelujah. Nothing shall be. Just 
trust you, Jesus. I'm not going to be afraid because these waves are on my knees. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to fear the storm. You are greater than its roar. I'm not going to fear it all. I'm not going to fear it all. So this is the third part of the series, Occupy, all right? And I have dealt with, all right, the first Sunday on this series, I dealt with our testimony, specifically our inheritance. I dealt with that as it were our past, right? Our yesterdays. Then second sermon, last week I dealt with hope, and I defined it as our future. Our testimony, our inheritance is directly tied to our future. But today we're going to deal with what is in between the yesterdays and the tomorrows. We're going to deal with what's in the today. Now I'm going to ask you some questions. I actually put these questions on the top of your notes. I'm interested for you to respond. Think about it. Don't just quickly respond. But I'm asking you, what caused, what created, what made these following things happen? All right, here's what they are. Kingdoms were conquered and occupied. Righteous government was established and justice ruled. Would that be neat if that happened today? Lions' mouths were shut. Fire didn't burn. Swords couldn't kill. Armies turned and ran away. Dead were raised back to life. What was that thing that caused or created or made those things to happen. All of the scriptures that are all these events that I've just told you are found in the scriptures, in the word. And let's look at the text. You'll find the answer. It's in verse 33 of Hebrews 11. It tells us how this happened by, there's a blank, by this thing, 
These people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions. They quenched the flames of fire. They escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again to death. And it goes on and on and on. What is the fill in the blank? Faith. Faith. So write it in by faith. Capitalize it. In fact, that's the title, Occupy, part three. I'm dealing with faith. Faith is that offensive weapon that God gives us to use so that we're not just biding our time. In fact, the the issue today is that so many of us, if we're not careful, deal with faith as though it's just a defensive thing. It's what we believe in, and what we believe in keeps the enemy from destroying us. It's the faith that keeps us. It is the thing that assures us of our future. The hope that we have has got to be lived out in a faith experience today. And what I want to shock you with, and I want to, I want to, I want to tell you, and it's going to be so simple for me to say this, but faith is not just a matter of believing and when we, have, when we have put it in that place, if we're not careful, we miss the wonder of what faith is to produce in us and through us. Hebrews chapter 12, uh, this scripture implies it's a run of faith. Let us run with patience or endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus who was the champion who initiates or authors or takes the lead in our faith. Now, I I want you to understand this. What I'm going to talk to you about today is biblically sound from the standpoint, this is a substance, this thing called faith that is created out of the very heart of God, and it is of God so much so that you need to understand that Jesus is the one who creates it in us. In fact, the Bible says God, even to get you saved, gives you a measure of faith, a measure of believing, a measure of faith so that you will put that faith to work in the confession of your sins and the, and the, and the trusting of your life into the care of the kingdom of heaven and the king. So, so this thing of, of faith that he even gives you, he initiates it, but he initiates it by his own life. This is something I want you to be able to grab a hold of today, and that is for you to understand that Jesus is full of faith and walked and lived by faith. He initiated it for us, and he perfects it for us and then in us as long as we keep our eyes on him and walk the walk of faith or run the race of faith. The next scripture is in Hebrews 11. So this is the beginning of that chapter. Now faith is. We've heard this all of our lives. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So I preached to you about hope and the hope of what God could do or wants to do in us and for us and and the promises he's made in our past with the inheritance. He said, this is, I've called you, I've separated you, I've saved you, I've redeemed you, I've, I've got great stuff. He's moved in our life, he's touched us, he's, we've, we've been in the altars with him, we've, we've felt his presence. We have this past thing that should secure us to say, okay, now I can be assured that the same God who saved me and, and has touched me and has been in my life is going to bring me into the eternal kingdom. And I, I'm, I'm living that now and I have this hope in him. But that hope is secured, is secured by faith that is presently, actively working in our lives. Faith becomes the evidence. Now, if faith is just believing, how can it evidence anything that is to be? Faith is the evidence or the basis or the foundation. It's not only the substance, the foundations, but it is the evidence of what we've hoped for. It is the working out of what we believe. Some, some of the versions don't have the word now in it. Most of them do, believe it or not. And in the original Greek text, the word now is there. 
I want to tell you this. Faith is not something that you're going to do. It's something that you believe now. Can I say it way, this way? Now faith is. Now is faith. Not tomorrow is faith. Not yesterday is faith. Now faith is. How does now happen? How do we see now demonstrated? What is faith? Is it just believing? In fact, I've, I've got a question here and I'm going to answer it hopefully. But is believing and faith the same thing? Is believing and faith the same thing? They are two different um, parts of speech, are they not? What is believing? Part of speech. It's a verb. What is faith? Now. Okay. There is no verb for faith. You can't faithing. But faith, the noun, has to act and has to be active or it's not faith. Faith is not just thinking or believing or having a belief, which is another noun. Faith is actually doing. For believing to become faith, it has to move and has to have an action to it. You know who James is? He's the brother of Jesus. He was also the pastor of the church in Jerusalem where all the people, all the Jews got saved on the day of Pentecost. You remember that? So James is the pastor there. He's talking to Jewish people. Now, if there would be ever a time where a, a pastor would want to teach and straighten out doctrine, you would think that James would, knowing that he's got all these Jews who practice circumcision and have all these things, that his whole teaching would be to get them to the place where they understood that salvation is not by works, but by faith alone, right? He doesn't teach that there. You know who teaches it? Paul in the book of Romans, who is preaching to Gentiles. And he's telling Gentiles that all of the stuff of the law and the Old Testament teaching and the, and the things that the Jewish people would really be absorbed with, he's talking to the Gentiles about it. And so we have in the book of Romans this whole thing about salvation is by faith, or by grace, and, and, and not of works. And, and, and we have the apostle Paul just coming down on them as though they're a bunch of Jewish people. They're not Jews. But we have James here who's dealing with a bunch of Jews, and I want you to see how he speaks to them. James chapter 2, he says in verse 14, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? I, I want you to understand this. I always will believe that people come to the Lord by the grace of God, we don't work ourselves into salvation. I will say along with Paul that, that the works of the law don't save us and we can't be good enough to be redeemed. I believe that with all my heart. But the counterfeit comes along when it says that you can have a, just a belief system that simply believes that God is and I confess Jesus is alive, he's the son of God, he died for my sins and that's all I need to be saved. I don't believe that's so because I believe saving faith comes when we believe to a point of there is a response to this work of redemption and the working of it, and the, the, the response to it is what James is talking about here. Can I read it again? What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? What kind of faith? The, the kind of faith that people say, I believe, but it hasn't changed my life. I believe, but no, I don't go to church, don't want to go to church, don't like God, don't, don't want to grow in him. I just, I, I believe, yeah, I believe in God. I'm, I'm going to go to heaven because I believe in God. No, that kind of faith can't save anyone. Verse 15 gives an example. Suppose you 
see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well. How about this? We do it Pentecostal style. You come up to somebody who's in trouble and you say, I want to declare over you that you're going to be okay and that you're good and have a wonderful day, that you're going to be warm today and you're going to eat well. I declare it and I decree it. And he says, but you don't then give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? Faith cannot be just a matter of believing or even just a matter of saying. It's got to be a matter of doing. Of doing. Faith to be faith has to produce a response, a change, a, 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 a motion, a moving. Let's read on. Verse 17. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless, circle it, underline it, unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. So here's the argument. I know, church, I know there are people that really, they just, they just have it in them to do good things. They're do-gooders. And they, they do good, do good, good, right? But some of us are just believers, some of us are believers, and there are believers, and then there are doers. What, is, what does James say? But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God, good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. Could I end it? It's parenthetical, but they ain't saved. The demons believe, but they're not right with God. Can you believe and not have faith? Yeah. I, I, to, to just take a hold of something and say, I believe it, if it doesn't produce some kind of change or transformation or process or progress or doing, unless your faith does something, if it's inactive, it is dead. You can't have faith that doesn't change you. You can't have faith that doesn't commit you. You can't have faith that doesn't propel you. If you believe and it's saving faith and it's God faith, it's, it's the kind of faith that Jesus said he began it. He, he, found, he made the foundation of it and he's perfected it in you. He's perfected it in his own life. You will be as he did and you will do faith. Verse 20, how foolish can you see that faith without good deeds is useless? I, can I pull you back up to that scripture on the demons, verse 19? This is really interesting. It kind of ties to my sermon last week. It says, even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. You remember what I told you last week? The devil's deal is he wants to lie to you about who God is and, and how you don't have a future in him and he's just kidding you and you shouldn't believe and he's trying to do this to you just like the old Goliath demon giant said every day and he just caused the people of Israel, these, this army to cower and hide and freeze. And I made the comment that, the, that, that what the devil does, what the enemy wants to do is just simply say to you, shut up and freeze. You see, if, if the enemy can make you not move, he's won. If he can get you to just believe but do nothing, he still beats you. He causes you to freeze. The word terror or the fact is that they, they trembled or they shook, <laughs> it, is, um, it means that they knew God existed. They knew Jesus was God incarnate. They knew that. But they didn't want to respond to that. And so their fear of who he was caused them to freeze in place. Have you ever been so scared you couldn't move? Well, this is what this, this passage means. You know what's so funny? The word in Greek is P-H-R-I-S-S-O. P-H-R-I-S-S-O is pronounced friezo. So the demons are friezoed. Why? Because they believe, but they don't do anything with it. You see, if the enemy can cause you to have fear about 
about your past or things that you've experienced, maybe even to cause you to forget them and, and forget God's faithfulness and forget your salvation, forget the cost of, of what it took for you to be saved. If he can somehow come against your future and tell you that those things are not there for you, he can just stop you down and cause you to do nothing. He's won. And you can sit there and say, well, I believe. But if you believe, there will have to be a doing, a moving, a response in your faith. So let's go to the chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, the faith chapter. I want to just bring up four or five people here in the beginning. So it's going to talk to us about people who had faith, the kind of faith that is God saying all of us need to have. His first one is found in verse 4. And it said of Cain and Abel, remember the two brothers? From, uh, Abel, excuse me, brought to the Lord an acceptable offering. His faith said... I will do what the Lord has taught us to do, and he has said that we should sacrifice, and I will bring to him an acceptable offering. He brought to him, he brought to the Lord a, an offering of an animal, a lamb. Cain refused, do you remember? And he bought a bunch of groceries. Now, the scripture actually says Abel brought a more acceptable offering, and by it, showed his faith and a faith that led to righteousness. And forever from that point on, Abel has, began, has become an instrument to teach us how very simply faith begins to process in your life by simple obedience. But it's not obedience out of command, it's obedience out of love. You see, the Bible says that he brought an acceptable sacrifice, meaning he brought something that was worthy of the one that he was bringing it to. Acceptable meaning he brought a sacrifice that you couldn't have done anything less because you're bringing it to God. And how could you do anything less than the very best? Please hear me, and, and no, I'm not trying to be critical, but in the church world, we do some things so many times that are so much less than they should be, and we call it Christianity, or we call it faith, and it's half-hearted, it's halfway. I, I, I think here in the beginning in Genesis, God is, is, is bringing up this man named Abel and saying, I want you to understand, he loved me so much, he gave his very best. It was the best lamb he had. It was the, it was the most perfect lamb. It was the most precious gift he had, and he did it because he loved me and, 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 and I think God's probably understanding and broken hearted because you get to Malachi at the end of the Old Testament and his record is the people are bringing the scroungiest sacrifices they can find. Anything that's lame, anything that's blind, anything that they could care less about, that's what they bring to God. And God's heart is broken because he wants us to understand faith brings God the best. You can't do Christianity. You can't do faith without doing your best. It simply says of this next man of faith, his name is Enoch. And what does Enoch do? You know his story. He loved God. He walked and talked with God. He worshiped. And he was so in tune with God, the Bible says, and God decided to just go ahead and take him and moved him up into the heavenlies. And Enoch was not because... Because he worshiped God. He loved God. He pleased God. He pleased God. You know what faith in its very basics are going to do? It's going to surrender your heart to him every single day. You know what faith does today? Faith loves God today. Faith works to live a life that we have communion and fellowship with him. And in doing faith that way, we please God. God isn't... Just stand up there going, you know, I really wish you'd do this for me today. I wish you'd go over here. I wish you'd do this. Now, all of those things become actions of faith. But here's what God wants. God wants you today. Coming to church, worshiping, this is a, this is a good deal. I'm glad you did it. But I want you to understand, he doesn't want your worship just on Sunday. He wants you to worship him when you get up in the morning and say, good morning, Lord. I'm so glad to be alive. I can't wait to have a day with you. I love you. Verse 7, what does it say about faith? The man's name is Noah. What did Noah faith? How did Noah faith? He, he built an ark. Took him over 100 years maybe, 120 years. We don't know. It took him forever. That was his faith. 
his faith did. Now, what was so amazing about this is you got to understand, he was building something that had never been. There weren't boats. At least not ocean liners like this. And where he was building it, there was no river and no ocean. He built it on dry land. He got called an idiot for 120 years. But he never quit. He never froze. He never shut down. He did faith every moment of every day. Believing God, he built an ark. What does God expect you to be building? What is your faith supposed to be producing? You say you believe in him. You believe because he's given promises. And one day you're going to be in heaven. That's great. But what are you supposed to be doing here in this middle time, in this today? What are you supposed to be doing by faith today? If you love God, if you, if you know he saved you, is that all that matters? You're just going to float until you get up there and go be with God? Or is there something that he's called us to do? Do you understand? Faith has to be lived out today. Build an ark. For you and your kids, it's kind of neat. He said he built it for himself and his wife and his sons and his daughter-in-laws. You know, build an ark. What, what, what is your, how living is your faith in the lives of your children? You remember me telling you last week the sad thing that happened when, when the Bible tells us and Israel came out of, out of the the, the, the wilderness after 40 years and they came to the land of promise and you start reading the book of Judges and it tells us that here they are in this new land and another generation grows up. The kids of these people who have seen the miracles, the kids of the folks who went through the Red Sea and the, the kids who, who uh, watched Jericho fall, the, 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 the kids who, who have now grown up, they now have kids but they don't tell anything about their life. There's no faith walk today. And another generation rises up that doesn't know God. Why in the world can our school systems be so susceptible to things like the critical race theories and these, you know, this, this um, taking away our, our history and putting in some new fangled history that is a, a bunch of lies? How can that happen? Because we don't talk about the things of the past. And we don't declare the goodness of God. Do you know that, that, that I've grown up through a period in time where I've seen God do wonderful miracles. And the best things I can do is to share them as, I was, as my kids were growing up and talk about God and do faith every single day. And y'all, we have got to be doing faith with our kids. When you got a problem, you got to talk to your kids about it and say, you know what, we're going to pray for, for, for Papa God here to give us a, 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 some money because we need this thing to be paid and we got this problem over here and this is, and we're going to pray about it. You get on your knees and you pray and you talk with your kids about it. And then when the answer comes, you share it with them. You say, look what God did. Isn't this wonderful? And you talk about it. We, we don't talk about it. We don't pledge allegiance. Some people don't even know to how to pledge of allegiance anymore. I used to do it every, every morning. Go to school. Pledge allegiance. I, I know this is two different fields, but we made a commitment. We stated something that we believed. Can I tell you that the way you live faith and do faith, your kids will live and do faith? You build an ark, they'll get in it. Or they'll drown. Verse 8, Abraham obeyed. What did God do? God said, you can't live here, Abraham. I'm going to make you a great father of a great nation, but I'm going to take you to a new place, and, uh, and I just want you, to, I want you to leave home. I want you to sell everything you got, and I want you to take off. And the Bible says he did faith. How did he do faith? He left it all, packed his bags, sold his house, sold everything, took his wife, his kids, his, no, he didn't have any kids, his, his wife and, and, and all of his servants and all their belongings, and they just started walking. And the Bible says, it's so amazing that his faith was that I don't know where I'm going, but I know who will be there when I get there. And so I'm looking for a city that is going to be built by God. And so I'm going to God's city. 
And the Bible says he left and went to a place where he never got to build a home. He actually lived in a tent among a people that were not real friendly. And he did so because he still believed. He had this hope, but it caused him every day to do what God said and to follow God. Following God is not something you do once in a while in an altar. It's something you do every moment of every day. And the, the Spirit of the Lord is with you. And he'll speak a word and say, this is the way, walk ye in it. And if you're a saint, you don't just believe it. Oh, I believe that's a good way, but I'm going to stand over here. No, you walk in it. You do what God has called you to do. That's faith. Faith is doing. Faith is changing. Faith is giving up things that are, are evil and bad for you and broken in your life. And you say, I can't do that, but I will, I will attack this over here with great fervor because I'm looking for something that God's building for me. So verse 11, Sarah, she laughed. And then she believed. And then she surrendered. And then she conceived. And then she carried. Let me tell you, woman of faith, that faith for you is just as costly as it is for any guy. It, the story of Sarah is a little, little comical, and I don't know all the specifics. I don't know how much Abraham explained to her what God had said. I don't know if he was just kind of general and thought women couldn't take it and shouldn't go into detail. I don't, I really don't know because he, he told her apparently that God had said he was going to be a father and, 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 and she just kind of looked at him. She was past the age. In fact, she, she was barren. In other words, she had already had menopause and, and, and men were on pause. And so there was just no way that this was going to happen between her and him. And she had no hope in this. I, I mean, what are you talking about? You're going to be a father. It's not through me. I'm an old woman now. And then she hears, she hears God talking to him uh, at the end after he's had this promise for over 10 years and nothing's happened. He's now 100. She's 90, 90 years old at least. And she hears the angel of the Lord or the Lord speaking to, to, to him and saying to Abraham, this time next year you're going to have a kid. And she's off in the corner and she laughs. <laughs> and she laughs. Now she laughs probably because she thinks about herself and then now she's looking at him. He's 100. And so God said, you laughed, didn't you? And she said, no, I didn't laugh. I didn't laugh. And God said, just believe me. But let me just tell you this. Surrender to the Lord is probably the most precious gift of faith that we can ever give. It spoke of Mary when he came and said, and the Holy Spirit will shadow over you and come upon you. She said, be it unto me. I think the greatest thing that can happen in your Christian walk is for you to have a faith that simply surrenders every moment of every day to God because he's going to come into your day and say, this is what faith's going to look like today. This is what faith looks like today. And you're going to say, yes, sir, I'm willing. I'm ready. I will do it. I put my life life before you. It's my sacrifice because I love you. Here's my question. Uh, this is a big one. Does God have faith? Let me add to that. Does God have hope? This scripture that is in the, in the Bible, chapter 11, verse 3, is so out of context if we take it at first, at first glance that faith here is talking about us because the whole chapter of faith on chapter 11 is defining everybody's faith and how everybody lived out their faith. But it begins with God. And it's, and it's like it's off if it only means that this is our faith about what God does. How about this meaning this is what God does by faith? Now notice this, and you're going to have to handle this with care and, and please don't get disturbed just chew on this for a little bit but the scripture says verse 3 by faith we understand that the entire universe was formed by God's command that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen we see a God who is going to create something out of nothing right and we know that's his power to do by the way, if there should be a parallel, God actually talks to us about having that same kind of faith that we could by the declaration and decreeing of the faith or the believing that we could actually see something happen that doesn't exist. 
Do you believe that's a, tech, a, 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 a principle of the word? We read the scripture and it seems like this is what it said. By our believing and understanding, by our faith, then we understand that the entire universe was formed by God's command. How about this? What if this passage simply put was meaning this? And it could still be read this way, but let me change the wording so that you understand it. What if it says, we understand that the entire universe was formed by faith at God's command? Is it possible that the very, the very characteristic of faith itself is a miraculous substance? That it engulfs the supernatural that when, when God himself declares something that is not as though it were, that it produces this miraculous thing and it is faith, God's faith, his declaration that makes it happen. Now, let me, let me explain this. There are characteristics of God that we know are intricately his or or intimately his, like God is love, right? So everything that we know of God is that if you have a God kind of love, it's as supernatural as God's love is. Do you understand? But we kind of have put the fact that God doesn't have faith or he doesn't have hope because he has omnipotence, excuse me, omniscience. Because God knows everything, how could he hope for something that doesn't happen like we? Because we hope for things that aren't existent, right? Yeah. But could God hope for something that's not existent? And because of that, by faith, make a declaration that would produce a world and a universe, even though he knew man was going to be sinful and broken and it was going to cost the death of his son to redeem it. Could God have faith... And would his faith be the releasing of the miraculous? At what point in our Christian walk does faith produce the miraculous? At what point in our faith or our believing does the miraculous happen? Is it when we believe it or when we act on it? Peter is in a boat. It's in the middle of the storm. And Jesus comes walking across the water. And Peter says, who is you? Jesus says, it's me. And, Jesus, and Peter says, if it's you, ask me to come to you. That's a dumb thing to say. I have thought about that forever. Dude, do anything, but don't just say, make me come to you. And Jesus said, Come on, boy. And at what point did Peter, Peter's faith produce a miracle? When he put his foot out of the boat on the water. And at that point, the miracle took place. Would his belief, would his faith have produced a miracle? It was the doing of it. In all of these people in the scriptures, it was the doing of their faith that made their faith work the miraculous. So, so the question is, does God have faith? Now, God not only had faith, but he also hoped. Our response would be that no, that no, God's knowledge would not allow him to hope for something because he already knows everything that will or will not be. If we then can remove hope from his character because of knowledge, then we should also say that he can't love or will not love because in, in doing so, he has an emotion towards people that he knows will not be saved. We say God is love. However, we could say, but if he is omniscient and knows everything, he really truthfully isn't love to everybody he only loves people he knows are going to get saved because his knowledge or his knowing would not allow him to love unsavable people God's love is limited only to those he knows that will be saved however to say that God loves everyone supersedes even his knowing that some are going to reject him and never love him back 
Some are not going to love him. The same would be true then of this thing called hope. To say that God does not hope for a sinner to return to him then means he only sets his hope on people that he knows are going to be saved. And by this definition, hope comes and then faith becomes the substance of what we hope for and yet not seen. So God must be able to hope for what has not yet happened even though he knows what is going to happen. Hope is the heartbeat that releases the actions of faith. In the providence or the character of God, he so believed that we would change and be saved that he gave his son for us. The Bible says he does not wish for anybody to be lost, but for all to come to repentance. Is that not hope? And he didn't just send his son to die for savable people. He sent his son to die for even unsavable people. Why would he do that if he did not have the hope that the love that he showed would change their lives? Hope becomes the impetus to doing what we call is faith. So in God's faith and love for us, he sent his son. God was motivated to save even the unlovely, the unsavable, according to his knowledge. Yet he still in good faith believed that we could and would come to repentance. He did not limit his hope or faith only to those that he knew would be saved. God is capable of hoping and loving and having faith and believing for everybody on, that he's ever created to come to him and to be redeemed, to be saved. If he doesn't do that, if he doesn't have that kind of love and hope and faith in us, all of us, then we would all just give up because we'd say, well, you know what, maybe I'm one of those that ain't predestined to be loved and to be faith for and to be hoped over. No, we have to believe that he loves and, and hopes and believes for all of us so much so that he is constantly speaking into our lives to change us. Now, because he knows whether we will or won't doesn't limit him because he's chosen not to let his knowledge stop the way he loves, the way he hopes, the way he faiths. And so God is constantly creating and working in our lives to be not only the initiator, the, not only the foundation for our faith, but the perfecting of it and the, and, and the one who brings us to a place where we will, by faith, respond in obedience and do what is righteous before him as we give to him our heart and our lives every moment of every day. And Romans 4, 17, does God have faith? God who quickened the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. I, that's the scripture, by the way, when it's talking in Romans about Abraham and who he was. And it says, and the God that Abraham served was the God who by faith saw things that weren't as though they were. And so I, I want to go on now, Mark eleven twenty two. 22. Jesus answering saith unto them, have faith in God. We like that. But let me read you some other versions. The Bible in basic English says, and Jesus answering said to them, have God's faith. The message says, Jesus was matter of fact, embrace this God life, really embrace it. I'm trying to tell you that faith is a life of doing God, of doing faith in a way that you do what God does and you believe and then you put your, your, your working of faith to action and the moment you have faith enough to lay hands on somebody who's sick, the moment you have faith enough to speak a word of testimony to somebody who's lost, the moment you have faith to give that dollar or that ten or that hundred that you don't have because you believe, the moment you do something to step out of the boat, it's in that moment that you have God faith and that God faith takes something that is not and makes it. It creates it. It becomes the miraculous. And that kind of faith, y'all, is going to take us to a place we've never been before. We've got to live out faith by doing faith. We have to be faithing. In fact, let me read that same scripture in Young's literal translation. And Jesus answering saith to them, have the faith of God. Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live, how? By the faith of the Son of God, 
who loved me and gave himself for me. Faith is the confidence. It's the, it's the foundation for hope. What we've not yet seen. And it is the assurance and the evidence and the proof of what we've hoped for. In this way, now faith does as faith is. And as I put my life in faith before God to trust him, my, my reasoning today was not to tell you how to do faith. My point today was to tell you what faith does, not how to do it. Because I want us to flesh out how do we do faith. What, what kind of, of things do we do that provide the miraculous of God? I'm just trying to get you to, to understand that faith is not just a consenting in your mind of believing. It has foundation in that. It very definitely has a, a, a trusting, a believing, a hoping. All of those things become the essence of what faith is. But faith is when faith does. So we show that we believe by giving proof through our actions and the moment we step out to do it, faith creates a foundation. Something miraculous happens and water is walked, walked on. Fire doesn't burn. Lions' mouths are shut. Walls fall down when we shout and giants die when we sling little tiny stones of faith. When we do, in faith, after God's very example, then the miraculous takes place. So I want to ask you, show me your faith. Show me your faith. Show me your faith. Tomorrow morning when you get up, hear God say, show me your faith. Will it merit heaven? Will it make your salvation any better? Well, I hope, it, I hope it, and you enjoy it. I hope it's a ble pleasure. I hope there's great things that happen. They, it doesn't save you, but God's going to ask you, show me your faith. All day long. Don't just say, I believe it. Do something with it. And when you do, Miracles begin to happen. When you embrace, when you confront, when you step out, when you give, when you share, when you sacrifice, when you, when you pray, when you cry out, when you decree, when you do faith, miracles happen. And hope is realized. But hope will never be realized as long as you just sit there and believe. Faith does. Show me your faith.